Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Dan Klein for a virtue palaver. I'm joined by Deirdre McCloskey, Michael Pakaluk, and Marcus Shera. This follows on to a virtue video that I um, did, and we're going to kind of discuss that to some extent. I want to say a little bit about <clears throat> this one picture from that, and then explain how this conversation got started. I discussed how good conduct, which you could associate with propriety, is um, one side of a spiral, and it's one of the two goods that I spoke of. The two are good conduct up here and good, the good of the whole, which is going to be down here. So we've got good conduct, if you like, deontology up here. Dion is Greek for duty. And down here, we're going to talk about consequences or consequentialism. And the idea is that Jim's conduct, we're talking about, say, Jim's conduct as seen by Mary. So this is all sort of in Mary's head. <clears throat> um, is something that Mary assesses. There's a sense of what sort of manners, if you like, propriety Jim ought to be doing in the moment. Um, and when she sees him perhaps deviating from that, she might think, well, gee, that's not agreeable to, to, to me and to others. And that agreeableness figures into her sense if when she turns to a consequentialist frame, beneficialness agreeableness is one of the things that figure into here. So propriety has a way of filtering down into here. We're now in loop I plus one and reflecting on beneficialness, the, bene the overall beneficialness, the good of the whole of Jim's conduct. She reflects and maybe tweaks her notions about what's best and what should be proper. And that then can lead to a new propriety propriety I plus one. It's not necessarily a profound change, but it's a kind of evolution. We hope an upward movement. She, this is so this is a kind of diachronic process in Mary. And we hope that this spiral is coming up from the page. And this new propriety then figures into her notion of the beneficialness again. And that goes on and on. And so I made a pitch that ethics should do deontology and consequentialism in conjunction. It's all part of one approach, a, a kind of unified approach. So we got duty and consequence. And Deirdre watched and wrote to me and we had a nice email exchange and she asked, are duty up here and consequence enough? Are they the whole story? I spoke of the correspondence between the two goods and she suggested maybe we need a correspondence among three goods. So what is that third good? And perhaps beauty, beauty, the beauty of conduct. And I suppose you could think of that as good aesthetic. So then we could have three goods, good conduct, good of the whole, good aesthetic. And maybe we should think of correspondence among the three goods. And here, by the way, let me say, I think it's useful to realize that there is a distinction here between beautiful to Mary and beautiful to God joy up here. Now, those are related, but still, I think it's worth minding this distinction between good in her eyes and good in God joy's eyes. <clears throat> now, in my lecture, do I actually treat virtue as beauty? Um, and I think in some respects, actually, I could argue that it does, but I won't, you know, revisit that now. But I'm very open and favorable to this idea of making it the, cor the correspondence among the three goods. And this expansion from two to three suggests perhaps three facets of, of ethics, deontology, duties, consequences, consequentialism, and then what's the heading for the third, is it virtue ethics? Maybe it is. Uh, that's fine. And then in the idea would be, yes, we need to do uh, our ethics with all three of these working in conjunction with one another. And so I want, let's proceed. And uh, Deirdre, you're up next. 
And so you'll speak for perhaps 12-ish minutes, Michael for 12-ish, and then Marcus for fewer. And let's see how it goes. So I'm gonna try to switch now to, let's see if I can do this. Um, whoops. This, there's there Deirdre's picture. There so Deirdre, go. you're on. Well, here, here's my point. Um, there, there was a great attempt starting in the 17th um, century, especially among English uh, thinkers and uh, coming to a head in the 18th century and then being con conventional in the 19th to find some little trick, some little formula for the good society and good individual behavior. Um, for example, consequentialism <clears throat> was translated by Jeremy Bentham into a systematic utilitarianism in which it's okay for me to use you up if I'm a better utility machine than you say. Uh, that's one of the large problems with utilitarianism. Or there's Kant, as you said, deontology. Uh, it's your duty. This is to elevate not prudence as, uh, as Jeremy Bentham did, did but, but justice to the, to the chief single virtue. And boy, we're gonna get a nice simple formula here. And that is Kant's categorical imperative, which is supposed to apply to any human, no, no, not any human, any rational being, whatever. And there's also from, from Hobbes and, uh, and to Locke, there's uh, uh, the, the, the choice option, the, the, um, the, uh, um, um, contractarianism as the as the basis for the good. We'll we'll get any, this. You can see in uh, John Rawls and James Buchanan among um, modern figures. We'll all sit down together and we'll all agree in some hypothetical situation to what kind of society we want. Now, the older way of looking at virtues, which you find in Christianity and in the, uh, in the pagan Mediterranean and in Plato and Aristotle and, and, and Cicero and so forth. And you also find in the great Hindu epics of South Asia and in Confucian thought, um, and indeed, in the thought of, I don't know, uh, Plains Indian coyote tales and so forth, is a listing of virtues and then stories to back up the individual virtues. In the, um, in the West, a kind of a thrown, to, a thrown together um, system of the elemental virtues is as this diagram says, the four so-called pagan virtues, namely prudence, temperance, justice, and courage. Those are the virtues of a polis or any other, any other, any other military and may I say, male society. Um, and the, those then were added onto which was added the three so-called Christian virtues, not because Christians are especially skilled at practicing these virtues, but anyway, uh, or they're also called the theological virtues, namely faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, by the way, love, as a virtue, indeed hope and faith for that matter, in, in some forms, are, are very foreign to the pagan way of looking at what the virtues are. So it's, it's a strange combination, but it's, as I said, you can find it 
find versions of this truncated this way or that in virtually all human cultures. Now, the claim of virtue ethics, of which Adam Smith, I always cross myself when I mention Adam Smith's name, um, is almost the is actually in probably the last serious exponent in Western philosophy until female British analytic philosophers, they're all necessary adjectives, in the 1950s revived at this virtue ethical approach. Namely, let's, let's look at the detailed virtues. Um, is, uh, uh, um, is the, what you quite properly call, and we, you and I decided, is, is the beauty part is the, because it's, we regard it as admirable when uh, uh, so someone sacrifices themselves for, for their, their country. Admirable, or if in an evil cause, not so admirable. We regard it as sweet and good if someone is, is loving, as long as they combine it with prudence in their love. And, and temperance. So these seven virtues can support, their, how, how to express it, they're the elements, the oxygen, and hydrogen, and so forth, that you combine to make the other virtues. The, you know, the, the long list of possible virtue terms in English or French or, or anything you want. Um, I'm saying, and St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas said, and and, in, and indeed, Adam Smith said, in, especially in the 1790 edition of the theory of moral sentiments on which he was working when he died, um, these, can, the, these can be made into molecules, so to speak, which are the detailed virtues. For example, the virtue of commercial enterprise is clearly a form of courage and hope and prudence, those three combined. Now it's not, there are other things like commercial enterprise uh, that, that are also composed of these three, but that's, that's true, in, the, that's true in, in chemistry too. And the point is, and here I'm gonna end, the, the, the sort of snappy solutions that under the, uh, under the inspiration of Euclid, geometry and proving things from axioms that the hard men, all men of the 17th century and the somewhat softer men of the 18th century instituted, these snappy little solutions are not adequate to the beauty of good conduct, good individual conduct in you, you, your terms, dear, um, or the resulting um, social um, good of the whole conduct. One more point: mm -hmm. modern philosophers of ethics and politics tend to focus, in a Kantian way, on one virtue, namely justice. And I think that's very strange. I'm here in, in, uh, at, uh, at the University of Arizona where the, uh, the um, great, in my view, philosopher um, Schmitz is. And he's writing a book in which like all the other um, analytic philosophers, at least the English speaking philosophers, all he talks about is justice. And I keep saying to him, um, uh, uh, David, wait a second, there are other characteristics of the beauty of conduct than justice. So that's my case, that in order to do ethics right, we've got to have these virtues or some other selection of them. And, and this is my, this is my true final point, the, the, uh, the beauty of them is told in narrative. 
in stories that you hear at your at your at your mother's knee or that you hear in the culture. Now this means that there's not going to be one solution. Sorry. <laughs> and then we have to make judgments about whether other cultures have the right stories. But too bad, that's the way humans are. Mm -hmm. Perfectly rational beings, maybe not, but we're French or Chinese or Americans, not Kant's or Jeremy Bentham's ideal calculator. Excellent. I'm going to just pose a question, but I don't want you to answer it, Deirdre, because it's, no, I, I think, the question that's hanging, and then I'm going to just go right to Michael. The question is, are, is, say, virtue ethics, uh, uh, does it <clears throat> demote or, or push out deontology, consequentialism, or is it about a conjunction with all of this? This, to me, is kind of the bigger question we're getting at. So, Michael? All right, so everyone can see this now? The yes. virtue we're after. Yep. All right. So <clears throat> I listened to Dan's fine presentation and read Deirdre's notes. And I thought to myself, well, what can I contribute to this as a philosopher who's really mainly working in the classical tradition? Um, of course, I'm familiar with all the figures that Deirdre mentioned. So I want to discuss the cardinal virtues and why historically, and really up to Adam Smith's time, as, as Deirdre said, uh, the doctrine has been appealing to systematic thinkers about virtue as well as kind of commonsensically. And then it, I want to use this doctrine in support of uh, Deirdre's virtue-based defense of market societies, which I find really fascinating. And I'm thinking about the relationship between um, that argument and Michael Novak's argument, who's a late dear friend and colleague of mine. So, um, these, of course, are the cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, courage, moderation. They're just there so that you can see them. And I want to say in uh, the classical world, there are three um, somewhat competing conceptions of virtue. And a first point I want to make is that the doctrine of cardinal virtue serves to integrate these, and that's one of the bases for its appeal. So here's one formulation. What puts something in good condition and renders its work good? You can find that in Plato and Aristotle, sharpness in a knife, for example. Putting it in good condition would include making it attractive. So it's thought that there's a kind of natural relationship between things that are good and things that are beautiful. The perfection of a power. Um, this is bulk and a muscle as Aristotle's own example. Um, the, the virtue, the very word virtus, uh, is, is male, as uh, mm -hmm. they're just pointed yeah. out. Fortitudo means really strengthness, <laughs> courage is strengthness. Um, I, I want to say the tendency of the first um, definition and the third are to, are to broaden uh, the notion of virtue, whereas the tendency of the second is to try to focus it and find just one, um, one point of power, so to speak. And then the third is any praiseworthy stable trait. And you, you find this in the kind of Aristotelian school of virtues and vices, just anything that you can praise and somebody is going to count as a virtue, even beauty and grace in a body. And this is the problem that Dan raised in his, well, why don't we count that as a virtue, right? So I've, I've written these definitions in such a way that they, they have wide scope. You now they apply to inanimate things as well, because that's the classical concept is sometimes people say it should be excellence rather than virtue. And they purport to pick out objective traits. And by the word objective, I mean simply that it's not depending solely on perception and reaction. So in, in Dan's scheme of the spiral, there's a large um, element there of um, reaction uh, to propriety and standards of propriety in one social group. And, 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 and Aristotle does have passages where he acknowledges that, for example, but it tends not to be the focus of the classical conception. Now, so, it's a claim of this um, uh, kind of the central doctrine of the cardinal virtues that any virtue falling under three can be mapped onto a cardinal virtue. So name whatever virtue you want can be mapped into it. And this is as it were the correlative operation to uh, molecular composition. Yep. Uh, and, and there were three different devices that were used to do this mapping. So one is uh, the way in which a species might be regarded as part of a genus. 
and that was called the subjective part. And the way that a component is part of a larger whole that was called an integral or quasi integral part quasi because it's not strictly a thing it's a kind of conceptual whole um, and one, and the third is if one powers part of another another if it's implicit in it a very trivial case is that if i can lift 100 pounds i can lift 30 pounds the power to lift 30 pounds is implicit in the power of lifting 100 pounds but they're much more interesting cases similar to what we would call off-label use in the use of pharmaceuticals this was called a potential part so here are examples, fairness in market exchanges, plain dealing, that's a species of justice. That's a part of justice. Taking care to deliberate well, that's a component at arriving at a decision prudentially. Prevailing in some worthy challenge over obstacles, magnanimity, that's implicit in courage. It's some kind of potential transference of what would in standardly, in the standard case, be, be, read, be identified as courage. Now, there are two upshots of this mapping project. Project The first is that whatever traits can't be so mapped, because you're so successful with you know, 150 such traits, if you have three or four left over, then if they can't get mapped, then they tend to get excluded, except insofar as they, they are regarded as expressing a cardinal virtue. And we've, we found, find this in our own culture now, that the beautiful body of an Olympic athlete in ancient Greece might have been regarded as a virtue of the athlete. Now we're just supposed to say, well, it's virtuous solely as expressing self-control, which would be a map to the cardinal virtue of moderation and perseverance, right? And the rest we want to say is endowment or which literally means a gift. Mm -hmm. So, and then the second is that this mapping of really hundreds of traits onto the cardinal virtue serves uh, as a picture in this classical tradition of second nature or custom. And there's this valuable observation in Deirdre's work that uh, attributed to Hayek that the Fuss's thesis um, prison is broken open by 18th century uh, discussions uh, of, of the sort of social equilibrium that Dan was introducing um, in his opening remarks. Um, and um, that takes place also in a different way, obviously, um, through this classical notion of a, of a second nature. Now, but of that kind of breaking open of the Fuss's thesis distinction, probably the classical mind is, is looking at as much as the, at the anchoring in Fuss's as a kind of opening up into a thesis, because um, it's hard to overestimate the importance of Socrates as kind of the foundational virtuous character in this tradition. And Socrates was a virtuous person who's misunderstood by his peers and put to death unjustly. So it ends up, this tradition ends up want, wanting to side with persecuted people and rejected people and misguided, you know, heroes who aren't recognized and so on. So it, it can't go too far in the direction, which I think we see in 18th century moral philosophy of, of, of a fairly close alignment between um, social norms and, and virtue. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Now, the meaning of this word cardinal, so it's from the Latin cardo, which means hinge, and it was Ambrose of Milan in the fourth century who was the first to use this term cardinal virtue. And because of this mapping, which I've described, people tend to take it to mean, if they know this original Latin meaning, that all the virtues hinge on these four virtues. Right? But Ambrose's meaning was different. His virtue is that there's a virtue of Sophia, contemplative uh, learning, which hinges on the cardinal virtues. He said the cardinal virtues were like hinges of door, which open up onto this Sophia. All right, so I want to explain that idea to you. So what are the cardinal virtues anyway? Are they just, you, I mean, obviously one can do a cross-cultural study of the sort that Deirdre recommends, and we'll discover that they're identified in all cultures and outside of Christian cultures, and we can call them pagan in that way, and the various defenses of why they're important for any sort of society whatsoever. But in the um, classical conception, as it became kind of thought through, this second definition of virtue, the second concept of the perfection of a power uh, tend to be tended to be brought in to define the cardinal virtues. You see this already incipiently in Plato's Republic, right? So you might say, well, there seem to be four primary powers in an act of life, and we can order them from lower to higher. Uh, you know, Dan has this interesting observation that we do identify the higher with the virtuous. Um, so there's some interest, there are interesting discussions in Leon Cass and, and, and Aristotle about, um, you know, up and down and where, you know, where these kind of biases come from in our nature. But um, 
desire, uh, let's say that's the, the, the foundation or the bottom, concupiscence, appetite, market um, uh, maximization behavior would be put here, um, spirit, spiritedness, era in Latin, thumos in Greek, will, next up on the ladder, then reasoning, ratio. Now, first we're thinking of an active being, so this ratio is, is, is um, prudential, practical, um, it's savvy more than anything else. Um, so, but it, it, the way I put it here, there's there's a space, right? We want to ask, well, isn't there a use of the power of reason, which is simply to know the truth? Uh, and there is, of course, but it really didn't become prominent until the, uh, the development of axiomatic geometry, I think. So that's that's when you know Plato's forms came into existence, so to speak. He realized there there's an there need to be objects of this power, right? So um, then you had a kind of completion of this with now not ratio, which is discursive reason, but more like contemplative reason. It was called intellectus. There's a second name for it in Latin. And it had its own perfections and they were called knowledge and wisdom. Scientia, science, comes from this. Now, Socrates was so overwhelmed and I think Plato was too, you know, the saying over the academy that let no one unskilled in geometry enter, right? That, um, he insisted that all virtue just is knowledge, right? The, here's, here's the second concept, right? That virtue has to be some kind of bulking up of a power and the highest power in a human person is this kind of power of reason and therefore that's what virtue is, right? But, there, but right away, and you even see this in Plato's own dialogues too, objections arose to this. One is a verbal one, that intellectual virtue seems to make someone simply good at something rather than good simplicity or good simply, good at geometry, good at healing. And then the behavioral one, which you see in, in, the, in the Gorgias, that, sorry about that, that people can obviously misuse intellectual virtue for bad. And yeah. it's, a, it's a mistake that people haven't realized today because we're still trying to teach virtue in, in classes in, in the classroom. So, um, so enter Ambrose. So he wants to say, well, intellectual virtue, knowledge and wisdom hinges on these hinge virtues. So I recall those two other conceptions of virtue, what puts something in good condition and render its, its work good, um, and the perfection of a power. Well, that's not the other one I've been discussing. This. So the, the doctrine of the cardinal virtues integrates these two, that inter intellectual virtue, in the sense too, perfection of what it would be regarded as the highest power in a human person, works as a virtue in sense one, only if the cardinal virtues are already present. So in that sense, it becomes a kind of capstone. It's it, really, it, it is the, the prominent virtue, but it works that way only if it's placed properly over a kind of pyramid of the other virtues. Yeah, that's right. So, and, and then here I want to apply this to uh, the McCloskey thesis about uh, market societies. So assume that bourgeois forms of the cardinal virtues are already elicited and upheld in market societies that evince innovism. And, and my colleague, a former colleague, Novak, liked the, liked, liked the term capitalism. He, he said, we can take this from Marx. I mean, just you know, say, well, the Latin root is head. Um, he relied a lot on the work of George Gilder at that point, that an innovist society is, uh, depends a lot on intellectual creation, intellectual property. So, um, so uh, okay, so then uh, in such a society, um, on classical grounds, and I'm, I'm giving a classical argument here because uh, obviously one has, to, one has to argue on the right and the left. So the left would be socialists and social justice warriors who are going to talk down uh, free market societies, and on the right would be people who are nostalgia, nostalgic for the Middle Ages and distributists and, and, um, and that kind of person. And so on, on classical grounds, right? Um, intellectual virtues in that society should be included in any first virtue-based assessment, kind of the state or progress or excellence of that society. And, and what I mean by that is it's not simply that with increased wealth comes, of course, increased leisure and increased material means uh, for pursuing intellectual endeavors, which would be a merely accidental or incidental relationship, but rather can we sustain the claim that um, the, the cultural premise that we should associate with one another primarily through reciprocal win-win transactions. Um, if, that's, if that's acted upon, there's an extra M there at the end of that word. If that's acted upon, does it tend towards an unprecedented widespread diffusion of intellectual virtue? And shouldn't this count? Um, and um, 
here are some, and if you, if you pose a question that way, I think it's really astonishing that there are firsts in the whole history of civilization that have been really attained in the last 200 years, like the institution of the weekend, which became a movement in the 1800s, right, and became consolidated by Henry Ford in 1926, saying all his workers would have two days off and get the same pay, right? That was because the workers were you know, just basically getting drunk on Sunday and then they needed Monday to recover. And there's this movement of St. Monday, you know, to, to make sun, to make Monday a day off as well. So you know, he pulled it back and that's when football became a big deal, by the way, and the kind of the football mm -hmm. craze arose at roughly the same time. But all, but if you go back to the original literature about the two day weekend, it's, it's actually to encourage also um, reading and, and study. It was um, the first time that leisure is expanded culture-wide for some purpose other than worship. Mm -hmm. That's extremely important. Then you have the wealthiest man in the history of the world using his great wealth to, uh, to place free storehouses for books in local communities. Like if you just describe this in a way that doesn't refer to historical fact, it's what? What is going on here? Yeah, well, that's what Andrew Carnegie did. Or what about legions of conquering soldiers returning from victorious conquests in foreign lands to, to enroll in contemporary equivalents of Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum, or you know, the so-called Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, the, the GI Bill. That's extraordinary. It's never happened before in the history of the world, right? Or something else that we take for granted, the licensing of the learned professions, right? So medicine, law, accountancy. Well, what does it mean for them to be licensed, right? What it means is that they are under their public understanding is reached that there's a reciprocal reciprocal agreement of trust, whereby they serve the public interest in exchange for prestige and what's recognized widely as higher compensation than for other lines of work. So you know, this is, uh, and these are just like off the top of my head, for examples, and it's really kind of astonishing. So if one uh, kind of, and this is again a classically based argument for extending uh, virtue beyond. Um, the moral virtues to intellectual virtue, and if you, and if you do, and and you know, of course, in each case, we'd want to argue this is not incidental in the way I meant that that rather it's it, it's a kind of natural development of reciprocal, transactional understanding of the relationship between uh, you know, capital and labor in the first case, and so on. Um, uh, it becomes a really powerful argument. Okay, so that is that's me. Thank you very much. Marcus, are you sharing, by the way? Uh, no, I don't have a screen to share. I, I was just going to do something else. But um, yeah, I just wanted to mention first that I was first introduced to virtue ethics through uh, Deirdre's book, the first book in her trilogy. This is where I really started to get uh, interested in it. And I was interested in uh, Deirdre's stuff because I was interested in economics and ethics and, and American pragmatism and how those things uh, all particularly related. But as I've gotten more into economics and studying more directly economics in the past few years, I always have Professor McCloskey in the back of my head reminding me to look at virtue and and how I, I don't want to dive into a prudence only framework. So yeah. uh, what, what I just wanted to share was um, a little something that I've written that I think uh, I hope connects with the rest of the conversation. But to me, it summarizes a little bit of how Professor McCloskey wanted us to use virtue in, in per, directly in economic analysis. So Aristotle says that virtue is knowledge about the soul. Knowledge of virtue is knowledge about your proper practical role in both the polis and the cosmos. Virtue, in that sense, is a knowledge that is intensely practical. The goodness of a virtue is a meaningful goal that is self-motivating. A direct understanding of virtue connects good conduct to the good of the whole. The utilitarian vision has spent a lot of computer time describing the contours of the good of the whole, but none motivating or clarifying good conduct. The Kantian deontological vision has spent a lot of time laying out the standards of good conduct with the contributions to the good of the whole playing second fiddle. Without a reason beyond the rules to conduct yourself well, the thorough instructions fall flat. A virtue, when apprehended, describes both what you are if you contribute to the good of the whole, and it gives practical instructions on the proper conduct towards that end. Holding that something is virtuous motivates the pursuit of said virtue. Virtue ethics provide us with genuine knowledge, with something that is true in a practical sense. If ethics is practical knowledge, how can we afford ignoring it in economics, the science of practicality? In economic terms, knowledge of virtue is knowledge about the production function of you, which by definition you are trying to maximize. 
The knowledge that we've accumulated in economics itself might be thought of as a study in the virtue of prudence. When an economist aspires to positive over normative claims and to remain agnostic about morality, they usually are just burying the lead and covertly declare prudence the only meaningful moral lens. Yep. In other spheres, we allow ourselves to declare chemical, biological, or psychological theories true as background to our economic models. Growth happened because scientists finally found the true theory that led to the steam engine and the cotton gin. Again, though, I'll say, if ethical knowledge is practical knowledge, why don't we allow ourselves to presume ethical truths as a meaningful discovery of how to live better by our little men in the model? When Jim sympathizes with Mary, he discovers something real about the world that elevates his behavior. It changes the matrix in which his decisions are made. When a man discovers his place before God, how can that truth be less impactful than man's discovery of the laws of mechanics? When we separate the positive from the normative, we separate the common meaning between the true and the good. Pursuit of the true without attention to the good, or pursuit of the good without attention to the true, leaves us with neither truth nor goodness. If ethics can't help us explain the world, then the ethics that we are presupposing is not about the world. Now, I don't know how to begin addressing this problem, but I suspect that the answer comes from dwelling in the great mind of Adam Smith, as Dr. Klein has spent so much effort helping us do. A complete economics pays attention to more virtues than prudence, heals the positive normative division, and binds back together the theory of moral sentiments with the wealth of nations. And so with that, I'm just looking forward to the rest of our discussion. Me too. Thank you so much, Marcus. That was splendid. Everything was splendid. So I'm wondering, do we are we disagreeing with each other at all? No. And if so, where? No, I, I, I don't I don't I don't see the Mm -hmm. I don't see any disagreement. I see supplementation. I see depth. I see I see uh, additional tactical points that I have that haven't occurred to me from from all three of you, and and that's good. That's to the good. To and and here and it heals the break between the social sciences and the humanities. It seems to me. To, to go in this direction. Mm -hmm. If we keep trying to fit, as, as, as you say, Marcus, if, if we keep splitting uh, um, the positive and, and the normative, I think this is true, true in, in, in Michael's case and, and, uh, and, and, and in yours then, if we keep trying to do that, we end up throwing away for purposes of understanding societies and improving them, the, the stories, the theology, the philosophy, the histories of humans. <laughs> and, 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 and I say again, against Kant, who you know, one extravagantly admires for very good reasons, against Kant, it's not the case that we should be looking for theories that fit any rational being, whatever. You know, a six-headed being, a rational being who lives in interstellar space. I, I don't care about that. I care about, as we say, practical reason. A lot of what you say, Michael, is new to me. Yeah. Um, what do you say, Michael? What do I say myself, or whether it's new to you? What do you mean? Are we disagree? Are we disagreeing? Oh, are we disagreeing? Oh, um, no. And I didn't intend to disagree. I did. Uh, no, just I as Deirdre said, I wanted to to supplement, to complement, to add a new dimension. Yeah. So should and we? Look, it's, it's the long story of human thinking about ourselves, and it's been going on in written form for four thousand years. Hmm. Let's so not we, throw it away in aid of some you know, tricky little Max U story. So if we think of virtue ethics as just very, very practically or basically, like you use the word, a list of virtues, some of them are yeah. more prominent and cardinal, yeah. but a list and, and they're, they're manifested, they're, they're incarnated in a way in beings and stories. That's virtue ethics, talking about all these different virtues. There's deontology, there's consequentialism. So we're, are we all saying that all three of these have to be integrated, kind of interpenetrating all part of ethics? 
I think so, but I just want to confirm. Yeah, I think there are some there are some significant differences between how someone in the 18th century understood virtue and somebody in the fourth century BC. I mean, I think that that's pretty clear. There's a, a kind of um, and 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 uh, there too, it's it's a lot of it is complementary. But in the 18th century, is a sort of awareness of sensitivity of a kind of a, a kind of group behavior. Uh, attunement to the others and being and a kind of automatic correction or spontaneous correction of one's assessments in, in relation to others. You, I think you did a very good job of exploring that, Dan. I think that's underdeveloped in the classical picture, but I don't think it's inconsistent with it. Mm -hmm. But I and think it, there's a, if I'm, a, if just one other small point, I, I think the, the classical view is much more local though. So uh, you began your presentation, Dan, by speaking about the good of the whole. And I don't, you know, in the classical view, the good of the whole is, you know, it's probably not even a meaningful concept. I mean, if you're, if you're in Athens, the good of the whole is going to have to bring in Persia, and that's the last thing you want to do. Right? So you want to just be discussing you know, what's going to be a benefit to your city. And you know, I think Deirdre was alluding to Philippa Foot and, and Elizabeth Anscombe, and that's the way they both introduced uh, the virtues as well. What's good for your city, for your polis? Yeah. yeah. But, you know Oh, they, 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 then there's also not just the, the dimension of time within a, a so-called Western thought, but there's the there's the comparative point. Uh, there, there's a f f famous story about the when the British administration of the justice in, in South Asia, where a local Hindu says, uh, um, oh, representative of the Raj, don't you understand sati, in which the widow is cast into the flames of her uh, burning dead husband, is our custom. And the, ad the administrator from Britain is supposed to have said, oh, yes, yeah, gee, I understand. I'm, I'm very sympathetic with this variation in ethical standards, but understand, we have a custom <laughs> in Britain, if someone throws someone into the flames, we hang them. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's not as if there are absolutely no standards to compare ethical um, s systems, but there are, there is variation. But could we think of some of this as different and, and evolving understandings of the whole that we have yeah. in mind, just like with the Athens and Persia. And so still you can interpret what different points of views are in their own conceptions of the relevant whole or the highest whole. Yeah. And you know, then we have modern kind of view of humankind, including future generations. Well, there, there, the there, whole. There, there's a very sharp change in the West, at least in Western Europe. In the understanding of the purpose, or not the purpose exactly, but what we should do in a human life. And until the 17th century, uh, I'm over generalizing here, that the idea is mm, take up your cross. If you're poor in this world and you know crippled and so on, don't worry, because you will attain eternal salvation if you behave yourself. Whereas there's a sharp change, which is evident in, in say, Adam Smith, um, that se se secular welfare um, becomes something we worry about, at least. So, you know, yeah, th th things change. Marcus, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was going to mention um, that I thought that the most interesting part of your video, Dr. Klein, was when you talked about history and um, and and how how you because people do worry about that. People think you, you can tell stories about how, uh, you know, in the past we have so, sort of received wisdoms about this being virtuous or that being virtuous. But um, it's it's another kind of modern spirit to reject history or conventions or things yes. that we've received from the past. That's and true. that might itself be for an, the, uh, there's obviously got to be something right about that on the margin 
snip this or that off, sometimes cut off a big branch like slavery in the 1860s or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But it, it is very hard to straddle both of those things that there is a there's a moral truth beyond what we have now, but also we can't get there without where we've been in the past, even if that means cutting off parts of that past. Yeah. And I think that the, a lot of, like a lot of I guess people my age don't know how to straddle both of those horses or we've been taught one side of that very, very clearly that we shouldn't abandon because there's a there's a counter reaction where people go completely the other direction and arbitrarily yeah. pick things from the past that they want to take on. And it's it's very strange to whoever's doing it right is not going to be friends with anybody, you know, yeah. it's not going to be yeah. friends with the future or the past. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that's right. I was going to say I haven't got any friends. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that that's another sort of common demarcation, um, relativism versus absolutism, which I kind of see this approach dissolving or transcending. You've got the universalism, or if you like, absolutism of the imagined view of the beholder who sees all these different histories, all these different possible worlds, mm -hmm. and has a unified uh, view about what's right in each node and branch in history. Yeah. So it's unified, but then at each node and branch in history, it could vary. Like sometimes you steal the bread rather than the norm yeah. of not stealing yeah. the bread. Yeah. Mike, do you, does that make sense? Yeah, there's so many things that are going on um, in, in this change that Deirdre was referring to at the time of Adam Smith. Um, one certainly was the influence of Newton. So, you, of course, we know Hume styled himself a Newton of the moral sciences. He wanted to be that. Everybody wanted to be a Newton. Well, the two marks of Newton are the, the are the unification of the physics of the celestial bodies and, and terrestrial physics, and then also the capacity to calculate according to universal laws. And uh, this was this put tremendous pressure on the moral sciences to develop in a similar way if they were hold out any kind of claim of being objective knowledge. I, Charles Taylor, I think, has uh, explored this quite well in his contribution to the Sen and Williams volume, but. Um, it's 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 a kind of imperative to be able to calculate, and that's very clear in Bentham. So, what do you get if you have to calculate? Then you get some of these hard theories of the 18th century. Marcus, um, yeah. So, the if 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 the ethics that were the kind of ethics that we're interested in, the kind of ethics we're talking about, does have these kind of historical contingencies too, it makes it even more important for the study of history and the study of ethics to go together, especially when we're when we want to know why we believe what we believe today, etc. And when we want to study history, that means we have to study ethics that goes both ways. So I yeah. think that that's that's the kind of uh, project that like Dr. McCloskey's series is it's not the first of its kind, but it's it's one it's one of a kind among contemporary economic history. And well, or, I, or, or for example, in Adam Smith. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But and or, or perhaps one of the only in in like economic history since the 50s or something like that since the 1950s. Yep. But um, but it, it does make it complicated. So for someone, I'm I guess I'm the youngest person on this panel and looking forward, I, I, I always hear my professors when I give them an idea say okay how are you going to operationalize that. And so when we're talking about something like ethics and if we want to include something like free will, then it's very hard to operationalize that in a I don't know some kind of mathematical or econometric model it's very difficult to do and you might need to use some kind of tool set that no one else in the discipline of economics or the discipline we're in is using and so it's um it's very tricky to think about but it's very exciting to know that there's a prospect like that well i'm 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 working on a book called god in mammon um uh which is an attempt to do exactly that to make it, it's it's aimed at it's, it's aimed at theologians, and to try to get especially progressive theologians in, in the conventional term uh, to understand that uh, that mammon, Aramaic word for wealth, is not evil in itself, as they now believe. Say by the way, on, on your on your point, Ma, Michael, about uh, about uh, um, Carnegie. I became a socialist at 16, reading socialist and anarchist tracts in a Carnegie library in Wakefield, Massachusetts. <laughs> and I'm delighted by that fact. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs>
You know, Deirdre, I'm working on a, I've been doing a series of books on the on the Gospels. I did one on Mark and one on John. Really? I'm doing, my next one is on Matthew, and I'm going to call it "Be Good Bankers" because in the oral tradition, this is a, this is a saying, a teaching that that's attributed by many of the fathers of the church to Jesus, and it's not in Scripture. And uh, you know, it turns out, you know, in in the Gospel of Matthew, there are many, 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 many parables that involve reward, use of money, um, savvy trading. Always be sure to trade to your advantage. It's it's extremely savvy, and um, it sounds like there might be some interesting correspondences between what you're doing and what I'm interested in right now. Be 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 fun to keep in touch. It, and I, Matthew, I am himself. very much interested in key keep in touch with all of you on this very point. Um, I've, I've uh, had some correspondence with uh, D David Bentley Hart, whom is, <laughs> who you know is, is an Orthodox um, theologian. And he's, he's a died in the world socialist. He can't, yes. it, he's told me. And uh, I would like to have someone who's more sympathetic with my point of view explaining the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to me. So I'm going to I'm going to search for your books. I'm very grateful to all of you. I have to run to a, an appointment. Oh, no. I have to go to the airport to get out of Dallas, which Good I've luck. been stuck in for two days by this storm. All right. Well, thank you so much. Look okay, dear, it's been extremely interesting. Yeah, and I want to hear more. Likewise. From all of you. Take okay, care. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. Bye.